Welcome to the sound of primes. Primes are the fundamental building blocks of numbers comparable to atoms that are the building blocks of nature. There are infinitely many of them and their appearance seems rather random and unpredictable. Since centuries mathematicians have tried to shed light on the distribution of prime numbers. It only was in 1859 when Bernhard Riemann was able to establish the connection between the occurrence of prime numbers and the theta function. While the theta function is a function much like well-known sine or exponential functions, it somehow captures the harmonies of primes. Nowadays, with the help of computers, it is actually not difficult to verify this connection numerically. This presentation is especially for those who do not only want to rely on mathematical theorems, but like to see results confirmed while crunching numbers in computations. In part 1 it is shown how step functions can be approximated by smooth functions and how this Fourier decomposition relates to sound and harmonies. Although there are plenty of good resources for the theta function on YouTube, there will be the necessity to highlight a few details of the theta function. In the main part of this presentation, the relation between the prime counting function and the theta function is established. We show how more and more harmonies of the theta function refine the information about the distribution of primes. And last but not least, there are a few calculations from Riemann's original work laid out in the last part for those of you who want to see the shown computations confirmed rigorously. At first sight, it might not be obvious at all how seemingly randomly appearing primes can be related to a deterministically defined function. Therefore, let's have a look at a much simpler example first. Consider a function that jumps back and forth between plus and minus 1. It is positive in the range from 0 to pi, negative from pi to 2 pi, and so on. Along with this function, an appropriate sine function is plotted. When a second sine function with three times higher frequency and one third of the original amplitude is added, then the sum of the two functions fits even better. Further improvements are achieved when the sine function with five times higher frequency and one fifth of the amplitude is added. This process can be continued until there remains virtually no difference to the step function. The additional contributions are called higher harmonics and the series of all coefficients in front of the sine functions are called the Fourier transform of the step function. They can be calculated from the original function by means of Fourier's theorem, which states that any periodic function can be expressed as a sum of sine and cosine functions. The Fourier transformation maps any periodic function into a series of coefficients and in return this series can be used to approximate or rebuild the original function from an appropriate sine and cosine function and their higher harmonics. I assume that the notion of higher harmonics is stolen from music theory and I hope that the following detour will build a bridge that will help you understand the mysterious sound of prime numbers in the end. Listen to the following experiment. Let's start with a pure sine wave of 100 oscillations per second. We also construct the higher harmonics that were used in the previous calculation. As expected, these overtones have higher pitches. They harmonically match the bass frequency. When they are all mixed together, our approximation to the square wave is recovered. After mixing, the higher harmonics cannot be sensed by ear individually any longer. Instead, the sound of the square wave is richer than a pure sine wave. Let us go one step further and compare this square wave to sounds of equal pitch generated from musical instruments. For convenience, we shift to a frequency of 220 Hz. The sound of a clarinet, a piano and our square wave are compared. They all show a unique repeating pattern at the same frequency. The difference between these three sounds can be shown very precisely. The higher harmonics that contribute to each sound are plotted with their amplitudes inside a so-called spectral plot. 
This is nothing more than a graphical representation of the Fourier transform. For the square wave, we find the base frequency and contributions from 3, 5, 7 and 9 times higher frequencies. The piano and the clarinet also have contributions from the double frequency, the first overtone and other harmonics. Nevertheless, each of these sounds has a very distinct footprint. Amazingly, it will turn out that the spectral footprint of the prime counting function is related to the zeta function. Hopefully, this is motivation enough for you to pay a short visit to the special features of zeta. The basic definition of zeta is easy to understand. Consider the series of square numbers first. Then take the reciprocal values and add all of them together. This gives the value of the zeta function at 2. Similarly, the value of zeta at 3 can be calculated from the sum of the inverses of all cubic numbers and so on. For large input values, zeta approaches 1. The first term is the only significant contribution, all other terms become negligible. In principle, zeta can also be calculated for non-integer exponents. These values smoothly interpolate the values for integer arguments. However, when the input value gets closer to 1, zeta grows without limit, which reflects the property of the diverging harmonic series. Up to this point, zeta looks rather boring and there is no sign of primes visible so far. It is possible to extend zeta beyond the singular point at 1. One finds a function that oscillates around the x-axis. The axis is crossed at all even negative integers, the so-called trivial zeros of zeta. The amplitude of oscillation grows rapidly. The connection to prime numbers arises when complex input values of zeta are taken into account. For complex inputs, the zeta function is complex in general. Complex numbers can be represented by arrows. The length of the arrow indicates the magnitude of the number and the direction is a measure for its phase. For instance, the real number plus 1 is shown by an arrow of length 1 that points in the positive direction. Similarly, minus 1 corresponds to an arrow of unit length pointing into the negative direction. There are infinitely many other complex numbers with unit length, one for each direction in a complex plane. The direction will be color-coded and the length will be displayed as heights in the following diagram. The most interesting part of the zeta function can be found along the critical line, which includes all input values with real part of one half. Along this line, the zeta function oscillates again, but this time the zeros and amplitudes are scattered rather randomly. These are the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function. It turns out that the position of these zeros decides which numbers are prime, which numbers are powers of a prime, and which numbers are built from two or more primes. These positions of the zeros form the spectral footprint of the prime numbers. Finally, the extension of zeta to the entire complex plane integrates the scattered zeros into a randomly looking shoreline that separates the ocean of simplicity from the wilderness of inaccessible heights. Now the stage is prepared to present the connection between the primes and zeta. First we need to express the appearance of primes in terms of a function. This is the prime counting function, labeled with a small pi, that always increases by 1 whenever a prime is encountered. In other words, it returns the number of primes up to a given value of x. For instance, pi of 100 is 25, since there are 25 primes smaller than 100. It turns out that a close relative of the prime counting function is more convenient. It is called Riemann's prime counting function and denoted with capital Pi. As before, the function increases by 1 whenever the input value is prime. Additionally, it steps up by 1 half at squares of prime numbers like 4, 9, 25 and so on. A step of 1 third is performed at every third power of a prime, 1 fourth at every fourth power and so on. Amazingly, this prime counting function can be calculated with the following integral. The integral can be further evaluated, but for this video it will be the object of interest. We try to understand its implications and rederive it in part 4. Obviously, for each value of x for which one wants to know the prime counting function, 
the integral has to be calculated from minus infinity to plus infinity. Due to limited resources, only a finite range of integration can be performed. However, the approximation of the prime counting function gets better the larger the range of integration is chosen. As we will see shortly, that corresponds to more and more zeros of the zeta function are taken into account. One part of the function inside the integral is the logarithm of zeta. Let's see how the picture changes when the logarithm of zeta is calculated. All the zeros turn into poles. More importantly, a rainbow pattern emerges from the spikes and traverses the entire right half of the plane. The path of integration is parallel to the imaginary axis. It crosses perpendicular to all the rainbows. Along the path, the phase value of zeta rotates periodically. The distance for one rotation is determined by the position of the zeros. If this was the only contribution, the value of the integral would be zero, as it is for pi of 1. The second factor, x to the power of s, shows a similar rainbow pattern. However, the pattern is completely regular and the period only depends on the choice of x. It is the interference of these two oscillatory patterns that determines the value of Riemann's prime counting function for a given input value x. I want to remind you that along the path where the integration is performed, the original definition of the zeta function is valid. Therefore, no information about primes enters into the game while the integral is calculated. Nevertheless, when for instance pi of 2.9 is found to be 1 and pi of 3.1 gives 2, it follows directly that 3 has to be a prime number. This can be done for any number in principle. The integral looks rather peculiar at first sight, but with an appropriate substitution it can be converted into a Fourier transformation. Unlike to the case of the square wave, the prime counting function is not periodic. Therefore, instead of summing infinitely many sine and cosine harmonics, this time an integral has to be performed over all possible frequencies. The spectral composition of the prime counting function is by and large given by the logarithm of zeta, and the harmonics are loosely speaking provided by the positions of the zeros of zeta. For those who want to know where this integral comes from, we will have a look at Riemann's calculations from 1859 and present a few thoughts of this derivation. It is not at all difficult to understand why zeta secretly captures information about primes. The first line in Riemann's calculation reminds on a result found by Leonard Euler. Zeta can either be calculated by summing all reciprocal integer powers, or one can multiply the following product, where only the prime numbers are considered. The proof of this equality requires a little bit of suffering, because every single factor of this infinite product will be replaced by an infinite sum. When the real part of the exponent s is larger than 1, each factor can be seen as a result of an infinite geometric series. Now this infinite product of infinite sums is simply calculated. Sit back and enjoy. As you can see, every conceivable combination of prime factors will occur exactly once in the denominators. Therefore, each number will occur eventually and that is all we need to show. It's easy, isn't it? Now the logarithm is applied to this infinite product and basic laws of algebra are used for simplifications. This turns the infinite product into an infinite sum. Next, the logarithm can be Taylor expanded around 1. You might get the impression that things become worse. Well, instead of a product of infinitely many factors, we now have infinitely many terms and each term contains an infinite sum over all primes. Sometimes things have to go really bad before there is any hope of relief. Same is true here, I'm afraid. Now in every term, each power of p is replaced by an integral. Interestingly, in this step, the different powers of p are now converted into different ranges of integration. The common factor of s is taken to the left hand side. Now it's almost time for the magic move. Let's focus on the first term and expand the sum into the contributions for each prime number. In the last step of making things worse, each integral is split into ranges between neighboring primes. Now all the terms are recombined, but this time column by column. And here it happens. These integrals can be combined with the help of the prime counting function. Isn't it beautiful and freaky at the same time how the prime counting function enters into the business? 
Similar, in spirit, all other sums are re-expressible with the prime counting function. And finally, all infinitely many terms can be combined into one single integral that contains the generalized prime counting function pi. Still, things do not really look promising. The object of interest, the prime counting function, gets eaten by the integral. However, Riemann recognized that this is actually a hidden Fourier transformation that is more formally called Mellin transform today. Most importantly, this transformation can be inverted. So the prime counting function can be expressed as inverse Mellin transform of the logarithm of zeta. So hold it, I don't buy it. Riemann tries to sell me that there is an infinite integral over a product of two functions that are completely smooth along the path of integration and the result is going to be a sharp edged prime counting function performing a jump whenever the input value is prime or a power of a prime. Never ever, this is absolutely crazy. I need a proof. Is it possible to confirm this result with computations? Let's try to crunch some numbers. Mathematica has a built-in prime counting function. The Riemann prime counting function is readily constructed, don't worry about the details. You can see that it has additional jumps by one half at 4, 9 and 25, by one third at 8 and 27 and so on. Let's define the integral with a cut of r for the range of integration. There are equal contributions from above and below the x-axis, so only from 0 to r is integrated and the result is multiplied by 2. The position of the path of integration is arbitrary as long as the real part A is larger than 1. After a few minutes the result is plotted for various cutoffs and Riemann's claim is confirmed beautifully. For me this is almost like a miracle. Although I understand the lines of reasoning I would have never felt comfortable with it alone. The more I appreciate the magic steps of Bernhard Riemann's masterpiece that he performed without the slightest chance of numerical verification. How much mathematical genius and faith was necessary 162 years ago to believe in all this, infinite sums of infinite sums along the way. I guess this is a good time to take a deep breath and cherish the beauty and the power of logic. This is actually calling for a second part. Stay tuned if you like and see you next time.